Hello, fights of friends. Seattle Mike here, and I am here with longtime MMA uh, veteran Adam Aguera, a friend of Ian Brewster. Thank you, Ian, for introducing us. And uh, how's it going today, Adam? Can't complain. I'm alive and well. How about yourself? Hey, doing doing well. Thanks for uh, doing this interview. Uh, with me, we were just talking about uh, your experience. Uh, you fought for Shudo. You were just telling me you fought for an organization over there in in Japan. Yes, it's not. It's not involved. It wasn't involved with Shudo. It's called X One Japan. It was uh, created by uh, Masa Saito. Rest in peace, sir. Oh, sorry, my bad. I thought I had seen something on your... I was just looking on Sure Dog, and I thought it said something about Shudo, so I had the wrong organization. <laughs> yes, that's okay. Uh, back then, like I, I feel like fighting in Japan was uh, any American fighter's dream. Uh, back in those times, it was, uh, it was uh, something to something to be very proud of. You know, they when they select you to fight over there from over here when there's many people they could choose. Yeah, I know it's a different culture over there. Seems like there's more respect for the fighters and or just uh, just a maybe a different kind of respect and a different way they treat fighters over there. Just that's so true. Um, the way they took care of us over there was very. Um, very different from some of the organizations that there was back then, you know, here in the United States. Um, it's, it's been like a lifetime ago though, since I, since I competed and obviously I'll never, never do it again, you know, especially at my age now, but, um, it was definitely a fun experience, uh, time of my life. You know, no matter what, it uh, it's something I'll always hold special, you know? Yeah, I love, I mean, I know a lot of MMA fans, they love the pageantry that we see over from Japan because everybody was exposed to pride and now there's Ryzen over there. And uh, But yeah, it seems like a, a, a much different atmosphere. What they was definitely, that? Oh. It's definitely different, like you're saying, definitely. Was that right before Pride, or was it overlapping? It was overlapping. Um, it, it's uh, it's kind of crazy because, you know, like back then, uh, Pride was so big, but then you had all of the stuff, all of the things that happened, you know, um, that got Pride to, you know, whenever they lost their uh, – TV deal, I guess. I think it was with Fuji, was it? Yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah, they were with Fuji. I didn't realize they'd lost the the TV deal. I just know that we were watching Pride, and then all of a sudden the UFC was buying them out, and I'd heard some things about the Yakuza, and I'm, but I wasn't 100 yes. percent sure. Oh. Yeah, I um, you know, from what I'm told from some people that were over there that um. You know, if you fought for pride and they told you to lose, you better lose. You know, uh, if you're supposed to win, you better win. Not every fight, I'm sure, but there was some that, I mean, you could you could see, you know, I don't know. It's it's pretty sad because they had, they had such a great brand when they were going in full force. I mean, who packs 100,000 people in a stadium like? Wow. Oh yeah, that was insane. It was like the like the Super Bowl over here or something. Every time they had an event. <laughs> no. Yeah. You know, I mean, as big as the UFC's gotten now, um, it makes you wonder, was it even close to what they were doing back then with Pride? Yeah, because I mean, I mean uh, Pride was huge over here. I mean, we're still talking about it almost twenty years later. So many people yeah. are crazy because uh you know you know in that that shock wave you got what a hundred thousand people there that would fill up texas stadium or even where the seattle seahawks play where you're from 
but you don't see any uh, any anybody going into football stadiums. You see them like going into the basketball arenas, like uh, eighteen thousand people. Yeah, it's a lot of people still, yeah. but in comparison, not. Oh yeah, the the only guy in combat sports. Well, I guess maybe there's like two in combat sports over here. It's Manny Pacquiao and Canelo Alvarez, the uh, two biggest boxers. And yeah, outside of that, I'm not I'm not sure the UFC could sell out a hundred thousand, honestly. Yeah, because I believe Canelo just fought at Texas Stadium. Um, I believe it was this year here in Texas. Yeah, so I think it's like seventy seven thousand people. Oof. You would have to get like a Conor McGregor and I don't know, four more people that are just huge sellers for combat sports. Maybe even a Jake Paul, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd have to be it'd have to be something big. Oh, talk about pageantry. Those uh, those brothers are all uh, all pageantry and I mean, I I can't hate on them too much. I did like when they first came out, but it's like okay, I mean, they kind of got their gimmick and, you know, their thing and it looks like Jake, I mean, he actually can fight. You know, he might not be the top of the food chain, but he's in there. You know, you're right. You know, you got, I got to give him his, his props, his respect for, you know, he, you know, you could tell he trains, you can tell that he trains, uh, you know, hard and boy, he made a, he made a poster of Tyron Woodley, didn't he? Even though Woodley is not known as a boxer, quote unquote, but yeah. I mean, wow, he played him flat. I oh yeah, and, 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 and even the, the first fight, you know, to go that many rounds and then end up getting the knockout, you know, just yeah, that that's pretty amazing coming from you know not an athletic background, not a boxing background at least. And, yeah. yeah, you know, they, 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 you know, I believe he came from a wrestling background in Ohio. Yeah, yeah, I think him and, and, and or his brother had some wrestling experience and stuff. And uh, But uh, sorry, a little bit about the, the Japan thing with your promotion there. Was there uh, any rumors of like Yakuza involvement or you ever see anything like that? Uh, no, uh, actually... Uh... Masa Saito, like I, he was responsible for guys like Don Fry, look, you know, making it big in pro wrestling in New Japan. They, they were close. Uh, even Chris Benoit, the late Chris Benoit, uh, he helped establish guys like that into the pro wrestling. The only thing that I thought was really weird in Japan, and um, I respectfully say this, I thought. I know this isn't going to make sense, but I thought this was the craziest thing that ever happened. You know, getting mobbed by fans over there, right? So they're like waving at the guys on the bus, the fighters. It was so cool. The next thing you know, we get off the bus. There's all kinds of people storming us. And then you look across the street and you see like seven or eight giants <laughs> that are like walking by with their head duck down they weigh like six to seven hundred pounds oh, wow and, yeah and then <laughs> all of a sudden all the kids and adults and teenagers that were surrounding us turn look over and took off running towards those guys <laughs> <laughs> so i was just like wow what just happened here these uh big giant sumo wrestlers are I, they treat them like gods over there i thought it was I thought it was funny at the time, and I'm just like, you know, I had never gotten so close to one. They appear so big. You know, they're across the street. And then at one Rumble on the Rock show, I think it was where Rodrigo Gracie fought BJ Penn. I met um, the guy that Hoist fought, um, that big, giant Akibono. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I'm being silly. I'm like, I want to know what this guy like feels like. So I had Akibono reach out and grab my neck, his whole <laughs> hand fit around my neck. And I'm like looking up at this six foot, six foot seven giant, like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, those, uh, those guys are pretty popular over there. I thought, you know, like I was all like, man, yeah, this is so cool. Cause in pride, they love the fighters yeah. in Japan. Yeah. They love the fighters, but man, 
uh, I think the sumo wrestlers are more loved over there. Yeah, it's it's crazy the culture there that uh, combat has. I want to go there just to like see, you know, the culture for combat because there it's like the NFL or the biggest thing in America. I'm going to tell you, if you ever get to in this lifetime, I say do it, even if it's yeah. just sitting as an outsider. One of my one of my good friends, Todd Atkins, um, he was stationed in Japan. Japan, and he would go to all the prides he trained over there uh he also lived in hawaii so he was uh he knows the noa brothers he knows sakuraba he knows all these guys like todd's a walking encyclopedia i got to spend time with him in oklahoma last year and uh he he's man he he knows this stuff <laughs> he's been around this sport for a long time uh he's got a great podcast like you do um, I would love to introduce you to Todd. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, what, what, what's his podcast? Go ahead and shout it out. It's uh Todd at the Todd Atkins uh, podcast. It's um, the Todd Atkins show. It's a really, really good, uh, very, very educational podcast. Todd gets into all the MMA scene. Um, he does everything from back then to now. Um, he even gets into the murder scene stuff. It's pretty cool. Todd's very educational. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to have to check him out because I will listen to other podcasts a lot of times. And, uh, you know, just sometimes they'll pick up stuff that I don't pick up. It's amazing how many things can be happening in the world of combat. And it's like I, I don't generally get into as much as like the pop culture or outside of the Cajun ring as much as some of these other guys and then I'll pick it up from their podcasts or their videos or something. So, yes. Yeah. Todd, uh, Todd covers, a he covers a, a lot of, uh, it's funny. He had a, I don't know if you remember Gerard Godot, the old UFC fighter, oh, yeah. the Dutch oh, yeah. guy. Yep. So Todd yeah. had his bodyguard on his show. Like Todd does, uh, uh, he'll do a podcast like that, you know, like he'll get into the background of a guy. I will pull up guys like Ensign in a way. Um, guys like that. Uh, Todd, I believe also knew uh, Kid Yamamoto. I don't know if you remember that guy. Oh, yeah. He was oh, yeah. Tough, yeah. Tough, tough, tough Japanese guy. So, yeah, um, I think definitely you and Todd will have a lot to connect about. It's Oh yeah, I, I, I'm a fight nerd, so yeah, I could come back and want you know talk about fights from yeah early '90s to <laughs> to now and in everything in between. But yeah, that would have been awesome to go to those Pride events and all those events over in Japan. I'm jealous of them already. <laughs> you know, um, I had uh, I look at it as. For me, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to do something like that. And it, it's just something that left such a strong print in my heart because not everybody, like I said, not everybody gets a chance to do that. And if you get out there and you go perform, do the best you can, then people will love you and forever remember you. And it's pretty neat. Well, and, I mean, you were, a, you were a badass heavyweight. Like I was looking at your record, all finishes. 11 and 2, what you were undefeated until your last year, and submit about equal submissions and uh, strikes. I told Ian, I'm like, I'm scared of people that do leg locks and nail hooks, man. You scare me. <laughs> well, you know, um, my, my two losses, uh, I believe, honestly, shaped me for coaching. Uh, whenever I got to start coaching it made me it just made me more um, to teach these kids to be more aware because a lot of times when you know you put yourself in a bad position or you you think you're untouchable that's when you pay the piper and for me i obviously those two blemishes i i paid for it and uh you wish you could get them back but then you know what they, they become learning experiences and like I said, off of uh, off my Japanese fight, uh, 
Jimmy Westfall has fought like a murderer's row of guys. He's tough. Um, that fight could have gone either way. We actually got to talk about it 20 years later. He's even been in my gym and we've, we've formed a brotherhood. It's pretty funny because, you know, that's, that's what any type of competition should do. Even if it's MMA, um, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, we've, uh, we've gotten to spend a lot of, a, a lot of time together over the past couple of years and, you know, now we'll be doing many things together. So, um, you know what? I don't, I don't have any regrets, but the funny thing about that fight, uh, I was telling them, you know, uh, I was riding home. I was getting on the airplane to come home and, you know, I was so upset back then. The referee sat two seats over from me and in between us was a uh, pastor from South Carolina or North Carolina. <laughs> so we, we got a lot of time to talk about the Lord on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> that was too crazy. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, um, I just enjoy being around the sport a lot. And, you know, this time around, it'll be nice to be on the outskirts of it as far as like, you know, being the coach. Well, when you bring a, a unique skill set, especially for heavyweights, like looking back at your record, you know, back in late 90s, early 2000s, there were not a lot of guys doing leg locks and knee bars and things. I mean, I not many at all. Now it's gotten, you know, much bigger. I remember Oleg Tiktarov, of course, from back in the day. That was one of the first guys that was – you know, really used it, but then there was, there was like a huge gap. And I know there was, oh, uh, I would say even some people kind of act like they look down on leg bars and knee locks there for a while. And then they got real popular. Well, I think a lot of, you know, like they say, anytime you go for submissions, it's always a risk, but especially like on leg locks, if you position your face near that person's upper torso, you could, possibly pay for it so you definitely want to separate yourself away and not get yourself in a in a position to get hurt so that's i've, I've always liked them uh, i recently started opening up some on on teaching them i'm just very weary of teaching them to just anybody though because you don't want some random hothead in your gym i'm gonna leg lock this other person and then something bad happens I, you know it's you gotta you gotta choose wisely on those on who you teach this you know and then to make sure when they're rolling hey stay away from the legs for now yeah unless yeah. you've got my full attention right on you and you know when something's gonna happen so you just want to take care of your students because uh, not all of them are fighters or want to be fighters but yeah. they want to learn yeah. so that's one of the ones you got to keep the training wheels on with, with leg locks. Yeah, because uh, my, my main experience was judo. And I mean, of course, you know, we would spar on the ground uh, forever, you know, practicing chokes and arm bars and things. But I'd never done the leg locks and knee locks. Like, every time I even see him on TV, it's like, oh, my knee hurts watching. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I um. One of my experiences with leg locks, you know, at a time where, you know, I thought I was really pretty good with them, but I met and actually trained one of Greg Jackson's former, former guys who was with Greg for a long time. His name is Richard Chavez. Um, at, he's won Abu Dhabi trials. He's won a lot of tournaments and I seen in Vegas where he popped one of Mark Lehman's guy's legs. Now they would use Rich to help Diego avoid the leg locks. St. Pierre at times when he was there, uh, Brian Stan, several of those guys. But anyhow, in my opinion, because I've trained with a lot of different people, that guy's legs were like an extra set of hands. He was so, he still is. He's in Utah right now, but his leg locks were they were just the craziest things to watch just because those legs were like an extra set of hands. It's like, Hey, you're cheating. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that, there's a lot of fighters that I've talked to that end up in Utah. I'm not sure why it is. Seems like they have a real good culture over there. Ricky Lindell, that's the guy uh, who has a lot of athletes in the gym. He had Frank Mir up there for a while. Uh, that's where Richard's at now, Rich Chavez, because um, he does stunts and movies and whatnot. But, yeah, that, that gym over there has got a lot of good people in there. Uh, yeah, I talked to um, – I've had Mark Schultz on, on the show not too long ago. I know he's training over there. And uh, Wow. Yeah, another beast, huh? Oh, yeah. And now um, – got him uh, – I don't know where our brain is today, but I'm trying to think of uh, the U.S. Olympian heavyweight gold that uh, uh, the beat the the Russian that was considered like oh. undefeatable. Oh, uh, Rulon Gardner. Rulon Gardner, yeah. Yeah, that was a beast, huh? Carolyn Alexander Carolyn. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Usually, I have a lot of these names. Some, or I should say, some days I, they're right on the tip of my tongue, and then other days it's like, man, how come I can't think of anybody's names? But <laughs> the specimen, yeah, he, um, that guy was something else. You know, it's it's crazy. Have you ever, um, have you ever wrestled with a had the opportunity to get on the mat with somebody who's a heavyweight, world class wrestler? No, I, I haven't. I went to, uh, you know, my daughter actually got to be in a camp because she was wrestling with Rule on Garter and he came here and uh, I, I met him, but I didn't get to get like on the mat with him. So, yeah, nobody at that level. I got to spend some time back in the early 2000s with Mark Coleman, Kevin Randleman, Brandon Hinkle, Wes Sims. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, <laughs> wrestling with... Uh, getting some time with them, Mark was like trying to grab a hold of a, a humongous refrigerator. <laughs> um, it's it's so crazy the levels of of people that you meet. You know, I mean, I, I have I had nothing to offer guys like that. You know, I mean, they're they're incredible. Kevin uh, Pinkle, like those guys. Geez, they were really, really, really talented. It's scary how guys that get that good at, at their craft. You know, um, that's why it's important in MMA. You just, you try to, uh, you try to develop the best you can in those uh, disciplines. And if you, if you can get, you know, to a certain point with it, especially nowadays, you, you know, you need everything. To, to be able to compete uh the fighters change it's not it's it's they change because they spend more time you know sharpening their craft to me it's not so much i don't know when you say basketball and like let's say you got a who's a superstar today in basketball uh lebron james yeah. <laughs> they're always comparing him to michael jordan it's like two different positions but you know what they're both humans yeah nobody's gonna I, I don't know i guess it's the work ethic that's put in you know uh and whatever is put in uh, you can't say like i don't know like say like let's just say this if, if mark was 25 all over again and he was just doing everything like these guys were now. Like, that would be scary. He was already scary back then. He was number one in the world when he won the Grand Prix. He was UFC heavyweight champ. But could you imagine Mark being a boxer, kickboxer, a leg lock artist, and he was already a wrestler? Like, geez. Like, and athletes like that aren't around, like, every day. Oh yeah, That's he was he, he was so sharp uh, and yep. so strong. I think he fought over in Valley Tudo too. I want to say, pretty sure he had at least one over there. But I don't know how many that? people, uh, you know, realize it. But you talk about like the changing of rules and evolution and things. When he lost to Pete Williams, I didn't even know this till not that long ago, or I just maybe I forgot. But they had actually changed the rules to where they could stand him up right before that. Or Pete Williams maybe never gets that kickoff. Yeah, Pete would have never got up. 
I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, Pete was a great fighter. I, I mean, for any era. And, you know, because Kevin fought him too. Yeah. And yeah. he couldn't get up. You know, um, the rules, yeah. You know, it's crazy. I see some referees today, they'll let you work. And then I see some other ones that'll break you quickly. I guess it just depends on who you draw also as your referee. But, yeah, I I, uh, I think if uh, there would have been no stand-up, I think it would have been the end of it. You know, like maybe not a finish, but a decision. What do you think what about stand-ups? And do, did you have a preference for a certain type of referee? I, to me, it didn't matter because um, – you wanted to prepare yourself for as, you know, for everything, you know, um, I never considered myself, uh, great at one thing or very good at one thing. And maybe, maybe I'm under talking myself, but that's okay. You know, I mean, I'm just trying to keep it as humble as, as possible. I thought that if I could for back then, if I could get into a position where I was, um, I knew I could compete. I was fine. It, it didn't matter to me. Um, you know, for even back then, you know, you, you had to, you had to be careful just as much because, you know, I mean, somebody might've been better than you at a certain area. And, but I was okay with, it didn't matter. I didn't want to get out of the first round, even when I lost. <laughs> You were a beast. You are being modest, but 11 fights and 11 finishes and you got submissions and knockouts on there. That's, that's pretty well versed. <laughs> you know what though? Um, it's crazy. I'm 48 years old and I feel like at this stage of my life, not because I ever want to fight again, but as far as my physical well being, yeah. I feel like there was times I should have been more disciplined with myself and you know, I, I, that's my only regret, you know, cause at times I let myself get out of, out of shape. You know, it could have been from like once my knee kneecap went out. Um, there was a fight that happened in Texas called the underground. And back then, for some reason, there was no, uh, no bell to stop the round. So I asked, uh, they asked me to go in there and Tell him to stop the fight. Well, when I went to climb in the ring, a fan threw a drink and uh, my left foot slipped. So my kneecap went out. That was the only injury I ever really suffered. So after that, I, I put on a lot of weight, you know, and uh, nowadays, you know, there would be no excuse for any of that, especially, you know, you could get yourself hurt really bad. And then, you know, again, um, back then things were a little different like let's say one of my losses i got knocked out one week and i needed uh i i said i need redemption so i went back the next week and got a tko oh wow, like, wow. that was stupid so anybody out there listening <laughs> i don't like the word stupid i hate it that was just not very smart of me so don't ever do anything. Well, they won't allow you, I think, to ever do stuff like that now. Oh, but, yeah, the uh, commissions, uh, yeah, it's uh, much different now. I know I see a lot of these fighters, you know, they have six-month medical suspensions even. Yeah, so. and I got my belt all wrong pretty bad. It was kind of scary, but, you know, you, I don't, I don't look at myself as ever being anything remotely close to being the best of anything, but I will say this for me to do that back then, that was very, uh, that was not a good choice to make, but it showed that I was willing to get in there and do what I had to do. You know? Yeah. Cause after the knockouts now, of course we didn't know what we know about, like about CTE then, uh, we know a lot more now. <laughs> And this is the first time that I've openly spoken about this particular matter. Um, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's scary because, you know, the first fight I got, you know, that, that first one, when I got knocked out, I dropped my hands, which was dumb. You know, the guy hit hard. Yeah. The, the second week when I went after, it was during the Arnold Classic week. Um, 
I start, we started fighting and I got caught a few times and all I could think of was like, Oh no, this is not fixing to happen to me again. Ooh, I, you know, made the fight a little dirty and, uh, I got a TKO. The guy quit. I'm like, thank God. Cause man, I, you know, that's an awful feeling for a person. You know, you don't, I don't believe that you really register the same after that. You're not the same person. Oh yeah. After getting, I'm sure a week later too. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I mean, as we get older now, I even realize like, you know, it's kind of just messing around with, with my son, you know, and oh, you know, try and hit me, you know, do some different drills with the, the gloves and I'm 43 and it's like, you know, he didn't hit me that hard, but it's like now when I get hit, it's like, oh, that doesn't feel the same. That doesn't feel the same like it used to at all. Like I wouldn't even feel that before. And now it's like, yeah. I've... So I, yeah. I think it's a little bit of an age thing even too. You know, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right. I, um, I don't know. I think that, uh, when, you know, there's, there's one fighter who I used to love watching in UFC and pride, Gary Goodrich. Oh yeah. I think, uh, I don't think he's the same anymore. I think he's come out publicly open and talk and spoken about it. Uh, but you know, that obviously happened to him a few more times than me. Um, I'm just glad that, you know, it never happened again to me because that's, uh, I don't wish that on anybody. Well, if you want to know more about Gary, I, I, that's funny you brought him up. I was actually just talking to him today. Sounds like he's going to be on the show and I, I'm going to interview him. Hopefully get to, I, I know, yeah, he's, he had a lot of, a lot of fights probably past, you know, when he should have, as he well admits. You know, what was crazy about Gary was he evolved. You know, he started getting better with his takedown defense. Of course, I think he was working with Mr. Tom Erickson and Mark Coleman and, yeah. you know, those guys. And, man, he, golly, that's somebody that he, he had some vicious strikes. His hands were lethal. But, you know, father time catches up. My favorite fight of his <laughs> – I know I'm fixing to catch probably some slack for this, but my favorite fight was when he, um, boy, I thought he was underdog in this fight, but man, when he fought Oleg and Pride, oh my goodness, that was a, uh, oof, that was his best display. I thought as a as a fighter. I mean, I don't know if you could name another fight. No, that Oleg, was, was, Oleg was a champion. Oleg was a stud, you know, or is oh a yeah. Stud. Was oh, a, yeah. And for him to defend how he did and just, wow, I was, you know, I looked at Mr. Goodridge as more than a gatekeeper for pride. Yeah. He was so tough. I mean, go on and be the UFC champ. Whoa. Well, he had some a good fight with Don Fry, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he definitely evolved. And I'm, he, I know he was like an arm wrestling champion when he came in. I think that's maybe all he had was a, his arm. It was an arm wrestling champion and, and a tough guy. Yes. that You know what? That's what he was. Yeah. I didn't see the cooks of one in him. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I've never heard of that martial arts and I'm not so sure about that. It's, it's a Korean martial art, but, and not to, and not knocking it down, but yeah, they, you know, they have the kicks like Taekwondo and I not saying that Gary can't couldn't kick, but Gary was just going to maul you. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't going to point play you. He was pretty, uh, he was a scary guy. Well, heck so is Oleg. I mean, a lot of one guy I wonder about a lot too is Igor Bob Chanson. Oh man. Yeah. That guy was a beast. <laughs> Uh, you know, he has the, still has the longest unbeaten streak in professional MMA. He won so many eight yeah. man tournaments. Wow. Like it was unreal. You know, I have a, I know Mark beat him and you know, when Coleman beat him, that was a huge win. Yeah. But yeah. One thing I want to say is, um, I have a very good friend 
Um, a lot of people don't know about this because some people didn't, uh, they didn't watch the dark days. And I mean by the dark days, you have, uh, they had a thing called combat in Kiev. My good friend, John Dixon, fought Igor Bob Chanson the longest because Igor was mauling everybody. I think Dixon, Mr. Dixon fought him for like 17 or 18 minutes. Oh, wow. And that was unheard of back then. Igor was just smashing everybody. It was crazy. But then when Mark beat him, it's almost like, (laughs) but I wonder how that guy's doing. You know, he's from uh, the Ukraine. So yeah. I hope he's doing, I hope he's doing okay, you know, him and his family. I don't I never met Igor, but obviously I know two people pretty good that have fought him. Yeah. And uh I just hope that he's okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope he's okay. I hope man. I, I wish that was a situation obviously that wasn't going on right now. That's uh that's that's a horrible situation. A lot of fighters over there in Ukraine too uh lomachenko i know there's a lot mm-hmm. of boxers and mma fighters the clits goes yeah yep. oh yeah there's a lot of their guys that are standing up but you know what it's funny because i was reading something the other day and uh they were talking about uh you know how they have their guys who are over there fighting and whatnot and america's had let's see Shannon Ritz, uh, Tim Kennedy, one of my good buddies, Mike Rodriguez, who, you know, uh, has fought MMA. Uh, There's a bunch of guys that have uh, gone to war that are MMA guys. Yeah. You know, and I think they would do it here, too. I just got to give them props, you know. I mean, hopefully things will uh calm down for the ukrainians and but i know we got a lot of american guys that have fought mma that have fought in a war too for our country yeah which is yeah brian, cool. brian stan um brian stan carl perry out of college station's done king of the caves he's done a you know a lot of other events around uh there's a lot of guys brian stan you have to that was a that was a very tough fighter. Oh yeah, yeah, he was in some of my favorite fights. Um, oh, what was it with uh, that fight with Vanderlei? It was one of the few fights. I think they only had nine or ten events on Fuel TV. But man, that's one of my favorite fights of all time. Boy, they slugged it out, huh? Yeah, yeah, they did. That's I, I, I mean, when I think of Fuel TV, I think it hasn't been around for a long time. But that's the only thing I can think about is that that fight, Vanderlei and Brian Stan. It's like that's. Uh, you know that's the legacy of fuel tv to me oh yes that was a great fight i uh i loved uh i just didn't like the ending (laughs) yeah (laughs) i uh, but you know hey vanderlei is a warrior you know that guy's been through a lot of fights himself oh yeah yeah and he he fought for so long and uh yeah, while, while we're on here, uh, just so people are watching, it reminds me of his battle with Chris Lieben, which I would have never thought that Chris Lieben would have knocked out Vanderlei Silva. And it was, uh, you know, it was very quick, but Chris Lieben, he's been fighting. He's hospitalized right now. Uh, he's He's been fighting COVID. I've talked to, he is doing better. I've talked to him a little bit. Of course, he's put a couple of little videos out there, but... Um, you know, whatever people believe in, if they want to, you know, pray or, you know, thoughts and prayers or, you know, whatever it is they believe in, he's, he's not completely out of the woods yet there. So hopefully, you know, he'll 100% heal. One of Chris Lieben's classic fights, um, he fought one of my, one of my good friends, uh, out in your neck of the woods, (laughs) Benzy Raddick. Oh yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard that name in a long time. (laughs) Yes. Uh, well, I tell you what, man, who, and I, those are two, two guys that had their signing moments in, in MMA, you know, um, and both have been through quite a bit, you know, like, uh, you know, Benji was 
getting some staff in his knee, getting it infected, uh, or, you know, suffering the broken jaw in the Lieben fight, and then coming back. And I don't know if you remember when he fought um, Ninja on CBS. Uh, Ram- uh, Ramsey uh, in the gym, or no, not Tom. No, uh, when Raddick fought Ninja, Shogun's Oh, J- yeah. Sh- oh. That was a beautiful fight on CBS. I remember that was the first time I think they did primetime TV for a fight. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I, I, I can't recall that fight right now. I'm sure I've seen it because I think I've seen everything that was on CBS, but I might have to go back and watch that. Yeah. And, uh, Ninja was a tough guy back in his time. And Benji KO'd him. That was an exciting fight. I thought at one time, if anybody was going to give Anderson Silva problems at 185, it was going to be Benji, you know, and, you know, of course, you know, father time catches us all. We're not kids no more, yeah. young, yeah. young fighters. And, you know, I think Benji's got to be pushing 40 now. Anderson's yeah, because, yeah, he fought way, way back. It's been a while, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, man, he was fighting at 172 also at one time. I'm like, I don't, how do you make it? How do you make it to that weight? <laughs> you know, discipline, discipline, hard work. You know, over there where you're at, you guys have had a lot of great fighters come out of the great Northwest. Uh, I can say I'm, I'm, I could say I'm fortunate enough that I got to train with some of them back in the day you know in the early 2000s um you guys uh you know one of my one of my one of my good friends rest his soul um he's a kind of i i feel like he's a legend of yakima uh rich garen oh yeah you know he's you remember him yeah man that was a he was an amazing person he was a good friend to me uh, you know, it's funny because he's responsible for quite a few people going to the UFC from that part. Um, I think he used to train Misa Tate, Brian Caraway, um, Julian Arosa. Like, yeah, man, he's got yeah. some. Yeah, his name's getting out there. I, I believe he trained some with Ivan Salivary, who's got a uh, a gym yes. over in Seattle now too. Yes, I, I've I've been into Ivan's gym in Seattle. Mm-hmm. I think it's in the old part of downtown. Ivan is a cool guy also. Um, uh, yeah, Ivan was a monster. I can't believe he made 185. He's huge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine how much some of these guys cut. He had to have been one of the ones that was really cutting a lot of weight. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, you know, I, I remember Ivan's fight. I, I want to say it was with a Marsulov. When he caught him in a, when he took his back and caught him in a body triangle and probably sunk his cup into his back, <laughs> made him quit. Uh, yeah, Ivan was a, oh man, that that guy. You guys have had a lot of great fighters, and that's not even counting the Oregon guys or Matt, all of Matt Hume's guys. Oh yeah, man, Bender, he, Benson oh, Henderson, Michael Chiesa comes out of Spokane. There's uh, quite a few guys coming out of Spokane. Uh, yeah, Juliana. Yeah, of course, yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, of course, Juliana Pena. Yeah, she's uh, her coach is she's over in Chicago now, but her coach is still flying out and training her in Chicago because her as her husband lives in Chicago. But yeah, uh, Rick, I met Rick once at a I want to call Cave Sport. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a nice event. Is that the in that Tacoma? Cage- Yes. I think, yeah, I think yeah, I think they're mostly in Tacoma. I have not been to one live because I do so many fight companions. Like on YouTube now, I see it come up, and I was like, I'm gonna have to cancel one of them one of these times and get to it one. Well, I know Ritz Ritz Garen's um, widow Julie. She uh, she's now matchmaking for Cage Sports, so they're they're coming back again. So. I really, really, uh, like, I've been to fights all over the country, outside of the country, uh, and that cage sport puts on a good show. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they've had some pretty good fighters in there. For sure, I've seen them pop up, and, you know, I'll just see the cards come up, and it's like, okay, yeah, this 
some recognizable names here from this area. So, yeah, um, I, I think that you probably out there. That's one of the most beautiful places in the in the world, Washington State. It's so unique. I always, I've always loved that state because I've gotten to travel all over it a few different times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, we we get a lot of rain. It's beautiful once it's over, but. So, you know, sometimes I'll admit, I do say, you know, we spend eight months of the season, you know, eight months of the year ready to move. And then those four months talk us into doing it all over again, because it is a long rainy season. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to, uh, I've seen all the greenery, the orchards, the desert, even like the waterfalls, like, wow, like, it's so, it's so enchanting over there so different you I, I went to a place one time where i think i was headed to yakima and there was an orchard of apples and picked a couple of apples and then right when you cross over one line it goes from being nice and cool to hot like oh wow it was so so different out there but yeah I, i'm i'm I hope that with all this madness that's, you know, happened with uh, America with the COVID and whatnot, that some of these gems are still surviving, you know, that they're, that they're okay. You know, cause you guys have, like I said, the talent pool of athletes that comes out of uh, the great Northwest and a lot of great wrestlers, a lot of great, you know, MMA fighters, kickboxers, you know, um, it's just, I, I hope that, you know, life gets a little more normal for you guys again. Oh, yeah, for, oh, for, yeah. for everybody oh, right now, for sure. But, yeah, speaking of Yakima, I remember years, years back, the first major boxing event I was ever at was ESPN Friday Night Fights. And it's when, for a little while, they started calling it Sugar Ray's uh, Friday Night Fights. And Sugar Ray Leonard showed up there. And uh, Angel Man Freddy was fighting uh lamar murphy but yeah nobody knew where the hell yakima was but it, it, it was desert. really cool we were you know we're looking around like where's where's sugar Ray leonard because i went to the way in the day before with some friends and they were having like signings and stuff and we see this guy he's in he's in sweats and sweatpants and stuff and he's like moving equipment around on the stage and i start looking at him I'm like that can't be sugar Ray leonard right and he comes, he comes right out, grabs a mic, introduces himself, and he's just sweatpants and sweats, and he'd been moving equipment out on the stage. And then, you know, the next night at the fights, of course, you see him in his three-piece suit and everything. But uh... wow, <laughs> yeah, I got to go to a fight in Yakima once. It was at the, I think the Yakima Dome. Yeah, yeah, or Sun Dome, yeah. Sun Dome, I think. Sun Dome, yeah. Yep. yeah. There you go. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Uh, got to see, man, like I said, you know, for the longest time, you, I mean, look at the talent pool that's come out of Team, or the old Team Quest. I don't know what it's like now, if it's still existing, or, I mean, AMC Pancration, I mean, geez. And then, of course, like you had um, Mr. Matt Thornton from Straight Blast. Yeah. They got yeah. Connor McGregor's... Uh, <laughs> His coach is directly under him too, so there's a lot of uh, guys got a lot, lot of riches when it comes to MMA out there. A lot of great fighters. Yeah, that remember, that Portland uh, scene was just, uh, yeah, absolutely crazy. From, uh, you know, Randy Couture, and Rand, Randy Couture was actually born in Everett, Washington, about 15 miles right. from here. But yeah, ended up over there in Portland, and but. Yeah, it's one all around. My... I kind of feel like sometimes like the, uh, you know, the fight scene is not what it used to be here. And then a few fighters will come out. You know, Juliana Pena hits pay dirt and Michael Kies is doing well. And like you said, Juliana Rosa. But yeah, I, I, I hope they get back to it. We can't forget Mighty Mouse. Oh, yeah. Demetrius Johnson. <laughs> Maybe the best pound for pound ever. <laughs> You know, I, I got to say that I, 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 I strongly feel that he's, man, he's, he's incredible. Yeah, he, he was so talented. And 
that's one of the things it was like it, it kind of blew my mind when it, you know ESPN took over the contract with the UFC and it's like okay you got the promotion rights for TV you got Disney and you have a super marketable smaller fighter whose name is Mighty Mouse it's like who is not catching this you you guys are really missing something here <laughs> I know. And you know, the sad part is when he went to one, I don't think Matt Hume could corner him no more. Oh, I didn't think about that. I didn't realize that. Yep. They don't let him corner him. And you know that that's, I, I, I don't care. Like there's a strong connection, you know, with them too. So that, that'll affect, you know, and uh, <clears throat> him for Ben Askren. Uh, no. Oh yeah. 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 No, that was, Especially at the point Ben Askren was in his career. And it's like, I know a lot of people, you know, they only seen, a lot of people only seen Ben Askren. I felt bad for him kind of coming in, uh, you know, and leaving that kind of mark too. But people that watch him in Bellator and watched him in one, it's like, of course he was never a good striker. But the elusiveness of that guy of dodging punches and things. Um, yeah, like you said, it was not a good trade at the time. But uh, it's like. That's like trading Russell Wilson for Ryan Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't, that didn't happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I don't think so. Oh, boy. That, no. There's always this rumor over here. And, like, Russell's like, oh, Russell says everything's okay. And then we hear these rumors that, yep. oh, they're talking about trading Russell Wilson. It's like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> well, and, you know, back to that trade Ben Askren is a great wrestler and yes he's you know beat fighters in MMA you know he had a good record you know and he the way he went out you know he was oh, you know everybody knew he just wanted the takedown yeah uh, it's uh, it's really not a knock on him but that's how Fitzpatrick you're good enough to play in the NFL you catch fire sometimes so you know what if somebody thinks I'm being a a jerk about this I'm, I'm not you know they're both pros but except you got one guy who's like russell wilson and you got the other guy who's like brian fitzpatrick you know oh, they're, yeah. they're both oh, yeah. good enough for the big leagues yeah. but that's i think that's a very good comparison like oh i think so too no that's a great analogy yeah but yeah so um i'm just uh <laughs> I'm just glad, though, that, you know, these guys are going to start getting busy again because I see that uh, Julie Guerin is going to be matchmaking again for fight sport, like I was saying, and they're going to be doing a show in Yakima. Usually they do them up at the casino, I think, over in... Yeah, uh, Legends Casino. Yeah, that's top, a really good cool place. Oh. Yeah. And anybody that's that ever goes to a fight there... Uh, if you're traveling, Jimi Hendrix is not too far from there. Yeah. I got to go to his, uh, I got to go see him. I thought that was like one of the coolest things. You got to see Jimi Hendrix? Yeah. I went to his, uh, where he's buried. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I've, ne I've actually never been here. I've lived in Washington most of my life. I, I guess I need to do got that. To go there. Uh, it's crazy. He's got his whole family around him except his brother that's alive. And then, of course, I went over to finally get to go see Bruce Lee's memoriam. Oh, my. That's that one. It's crazy because I love Jimi Hendrix. But when I went to see Bruce Lee's uh, burial site, that was a trip. It's I don't think of when you think of a, uh, a funeral, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a, a cemetery, yeah. you don't think of it as beautiful. Yeah. But yeah. where he's buried, you can see the lake, and it's just insane. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't go there for a long time either, and I finally did. Well, it was about a year ago, and yeah, it's, it, it's incredible. And people there told me it's like there's never a time when there's not people there. The only time I would... I would, I wouldn't dare try to go there. Is uh, you know how there's that road that goes to the cemetery? It's like at a slope. Like oh this. yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want to climb that in the winter. 
but yeah, it's a, it's a really nice place out there. I am very like, wow. I was wowed. I couldn't stop thinking about it for two weeks. Wow. Yeah. And that's uh, like you talk about the history of martial arts in Seattle. Yeah. I've, I do kind of feel like things have fallen off. Like you have to have some martial artists here, but, um, Oh, and there was a movie that was a martial arts movie that was made in Seattle like last year. And I can't remember what it was. And I'm thinking, Oh, they're going to bring MMA back to, uh, Seattle. And, uh, I, I was not real impressed, but I, I, I can't think of what it was now. But uh, yeah, it, it'd be nice to see Seattle bring back martial arts, you know, be known as like a mecca of martial arts again. Because there was the the, first, the oldest uh, judo school in, uh, the, in the United States, at least, is here in Seattle, too. Oh, wow. So that's... Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I mean, there was just, I don't know, the, the talent pool over there is just, it, it's huge. I mean, you had a lot of, heck, you had Dennis Hallman out there too. Yeah. Uh, he did, you know, in his earlier days, he did, I mean, look, he beat Matt Hughes twice in under a minute combined. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. everybody thought of the first time, oh, that's not going to happen again. <laughs> uh, I mean... You know, it's funny because, you know, BJ Penn is one of the great fighters of all time. Yeah. yeah. And they talk about how he beat Matt Hughes, but rarely do you hear people talking about how easily Dennis dispatched him. Easier than anybody. Yeah. I. Do you think that was just one of those styles make matchups kind of thing? You know what? A hundred percent I do. And from what I understand, um, I was told a story by one of the guys who actually was in the camp with Dennis for this fight that they kept drilling the slam. Matt, Matt Hume had them drilling the slam, setting Dennis up for that arm bar. Uh, uh, and sure enough, it played right into it. Uh, that was pretty crazy. Like, you know, but Dennis... Dennis had, I don't know if he still trains or not now, but I remember getting on the mat with him a long time ago. And one thing about Dennis was he was so slick at taking somebody's back. It was funny because we were at, um, oh my gosh, he has a gym in Everett, um, Charlie Pearson's gym. Oh, Charlie's oh. Combat Club. Yes, Charlie's oh. such a nice guy. I got to meet him. We, uh, me, Dennis, Benji, and a couple of other people. Oh, what was his name? Eddie Ellis. This was before Eddie was in the UFC or anything like that. A couple of us, we were over there, and it was funny. I was rolling with Dennis, and someone goes he's gonna take your back i'm like no he's not i got him right in front of me <laughs> next thing you know dennis is behind me i'm like oh my god like are you kidding me he's like and they're like oh he does it to everybody i'm like yeah he's one of the slickest guys back then that i man you know like i said there's levels to people it's crazy yeah, it's that's so another crazy. one of those guys that never, you know, doesn't really get his due, I think. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned him. You know what was so funny about that day? We were all out there training, right? Uh, we had gotten in the car. We were, like, basically driving around the Northwest. So we're there at uh, Charlie Pearson's gym. And in the middle of the training session, it was so funny who comes walking in. Melvin Gilliard. He had just bought in Idaho. I knew Melvin's uh, manager uh, from Louisiana. And it was funny because Mr. Joe Ancona, he's been around the, the scene over here for a long time. It was so funny. Uh, yeah, Melvin walked in there with him. And Dennis and Benji, uh, they, they got to roll with Melvin. That was... Uh, <laughs> that was pretty fun uh but yeah those guys geez but 
I don't say it enough, but you know what? There's uh, I've been blessed to either train with some this world class spectacular people. And fortunately for myself, I could say that you know what? Even the lickings I took in a practice, I I'm able to bring them back and and make it a lesson here in my gym. And my gym's now been open for 17 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll take you through a little tour of in here. So, you know, I, to me, it's about being a better coach than uh, making the kids better than I ever was. So, like, here's some team trophies from Naga. We've won a first place one before at Worlds. Uh, as a team. And I got a lot of hardware there. This is my prize, my son. <laughs> this is one of my girl's walls. Wow. And then over there, that's a mixture of boxing belts, kickboxing, and jujitsu belts. This is inside my club. And then I'll take you through the backside. I didn't turn on the lights, but I will. This is where the magic happens. Oops. But yeah, it's my, it's my little, uh, it's my sanctuary in here. I love doing a, I love coming to work every day. Oh, that, that's awesome. Yeah, I can't imagine a more satisfying uh, place to come to work every day than, than a dojo. That's, that's great. And Thank yeah, you for showing I us just, that. This you're the first one to show off your uh, dojo on the show, actually, too. Um, you know what? It's uh, a lot of uh, dojo owners. Sometimes they some will put back into their place, and some will put into their home or their cars. I like to put back in my place to give these people the best place possible to train. Yeah, so that's that's what i like to do keep it like that one day hopefully ian's gonna come down here and visit me <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he will probably when things uh when, when things calm down a little bit <laughs> yeah ian's an awesome guy i'm thankful that he connected us he's uh he's been a good friend of mine for a long time um i met him in montreal at Alex Capricci's Apex, and uh, Ian and I hit it off. Oh, yeah, I've just, yeah, uh, the first time I talked to him, and I was like, oh, man, this is su such a great guy, and just talked to him for hours, yeah. Ian's, Ian's the real deal, for sure. He really is. He's left an impact on my life for, for years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, me as well, when he... Uh, you know, started introducing me to the first guest that I, I had on the show, actually uh, introduced me to Art Davey, who was, of course, the, you know, founder <laughs> of the UFC. That's when when I was just starting, too. So that was uh, wow, really, really awesome. Yeah, Mr. Davey's awesome. You're going to you're going to have to meet Todd Atkins. You'll love Todd. He's a good guy. You'll have a lot to talk about. I have a lot in common for sure. Yeah, I, I I look forward to it. I I did have a question. I meant to back up real quick because we were talking about Dem to Demetrius Johnson, and it's not necessarily a right uh, answer on this. But I've asked a lot of people, did you score the the uh, Henry Cejudo Demetrius Johnson fight too? And did you have uh, did you have a winner for that? Number one. There's a couple of things that, from what my understanding, that were going on behind the scenes. Um, 
I heard that Matt wasn't uh, able to train with uh, Mighty Mouse due to some injury. And Matt's a very hands-on coach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think maybe that could have hindered a little bit of uh, Demetrius's uh, performance. But in a title fight, as you know, you have to take the title from somebody. Yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. just, you know, and I don't believe that that happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, do I believe it was a close fight? Very razor close. But yeah. I don't feel like yeah. at that time and moment that he took that belt from him. Um, he did nullify a couple of things of uh, Demetrius, but overall, I would have to say that Demetrius won razor close because he's the champion or was. Yeah. yeah. But that's not to take anything away from Henry because, man, I, I think that that took Henry's confidence to a whole nother level. And the scary thing about those two that <clears throat> nobody really talks about right now is the day that they decide to become full-time coaches, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Oh, ab oh absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And Henry's been coaching some guys and I mean, we've seen some quick results. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, uh, yeah, that uh, 125 pound title fight was one of them. Yeah. And yeah. now he's fixing to coach somebody against uh volkanowski uh who's that uh the korean zombie right oh yeah yeah yep that's gonna be very interesting how that fight plays out <clears throat> now if korean zombie has a if if this is a big if if he wins it's gonna be due to the training camp he's getting there yeah, and, and, and Cejudo, he <laughs> trained, what, Devison Figueredo, and I thought Figueredo yes. looked, looked incredible. Mm, yes, he and did. He took that belt, I thought. I, I, I thought he won that <laughs> fight. I know a lot of people have said Brand, they thought Brandon won it. No. I, I didn't think Figure, so either. Yeah. <laughs> bigger, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, no, Henry's camp helped him a lot. I mean, those two guys are just such competitive fighters. They're both so good. And they have some of the same qualities. But, I mean, where he went to camp at, that 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 helped him pull that fight out. Yeah, because I thought, you, you know, the first thing that time they fought, I'm like, okay, you know, when Divis and Figueredo, I was like, okay, the point was taken away. It was maybe a bit of a weight cut. I honestly didn't think that Brandon – was ever going to beat Devison and I was I was pretty shocked the second fight when you know when Brandon beat him pretty handily and then uh yeah Devison to to come back from that from getting beat to you know turn it back around was pretty incredible he had him Henry had that guy in such great shape and I think that's one of the things that Devison lacked that's why he was cutting so much weight. And he they say that he his weight was not even close to an issue in this fight. So I think that helped him a lot. Yeah, I, I honestly I, didn't uh, think that he was ever going to make 125 again. I figured he was just going to go up to Bantamweight. But... And, I mean, the power that he has for that weight class is crazy. Oh man, yeah, he's yeah, he he's an animal. To I don't know what he walks around at, but to think that that's a hundred and twenty five pound human being doesn't seem to make sense. <laughs> I gotta say, he probably walks around at about one fifty. Oh um, yeah, I I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, that's ugh, that's a that's a cut. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I'm glad I'm not making those cuts. <laughs> Never been a fan yeah, of weight cutting. That's too much. Yeah. Yeah. So, who did you have in that uh, fight with Cejudo and uh, <coughs> Mighty oh. Mouse? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. dry throat all of a sudden <laughs> um <clears throat> so the first time i watched it 
I judged it for Cejudo. <clears throat> and then I actually talked to uh, Jeremy Horn, who is doing, uh, he's doing a lot of judging and uh, refereeing right now. And he kind of let into me, actually. He's like, you really think Henry Cejudo won that fight? He wasn't very nice about it, to be honest. He's like, you don't know what you're watching. And he started going down and he's like, sent me the, you know, the WBC rules of how they judge fights. And I thought I was pretty decent at judging fights at the time. But he's like, dude, he's like, those takedowns, he's like, I don't care what those judges says. But he's like, look in the rules. When there's a takedown, there's no damage done. He's like, that's basically like nothing happened. That's right. And I've, I've watched fights a lot differently since then. And not only that, but he didn't keep him down either. No, he didn't. He bounced right back up. And that was, uh, you know, I think that was one of Jeremy's uh, big points there. And he's like, dude, that's basically like a jab. He's like, you're basically trying to judge somebody winning a fight by, like, landing a jab. But, it, you know, a takedown that, that nothing happened. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I agree with him a hundred percent. That that was my whole take from the very first time I you know when I watched the fight, you know on TV. I'm like, man, I can't believe. And then he winds up getting traded shortly after that. Like, wow, talk about disrespecting a champion, huh? Oh yeah, and we really uh, needed to see that fight again. I mean, I I really wanted to see that fight again, of course. I don't believe Henry wanted to see that fight again. Yeah. I really I, don't. If, if uh, Mighty Mouse had a the proper camp like he would normally would, I don't know, just at that time, I believe like he was one of the more unstoppable people. He was on a, he was on a roll. Oh yeah. He was, he was very good. He was so creative with the striking, striking and his grappling. And it's like, then you're going to come back and you're going to let him watch tape with Matt Hume and decide the few little things that he thinks he made mistakes on. Yeah. That's uh mm -hmm. and like you said, nothing against Cejudo. That guy's a great, you know, he's great at studying tapes and coaching all that stuff too. But yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll see the third fight somewhere. I don't know where it'd be, but <laughs> that would be pretty cool. But you know, I think Mighty Mouse is locked in at one, huh? Yeah, well, I mean, technically, Cejudo, well, I guess if he came back, he'd be on a UFC contract, though. So, never mind. I don't know how many fights he would have left, but or if he would be even interested in that. Yeah, I, I wonder if he'll fight again. Well, Cejudo, I know Cejudo said that he would fight again, but he's he's holding out for the money, and... I never blame these guys for holding out for money because yeah, you only get I, I to do it so many times. Some of them are, I don't believe they're compensated like they should be. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know you're putting together a card. I know there's a lot of cost and whatnot, but my gosh, you got a company that's worth over $4 billion. Oh yeah. At, at this point. Yeah. Five, six hundred thousand dollars Like, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you you got to start paying these guys a lot more, in, in my opinion too. And it's, I know people have made the case, and I used to make the case before the UFC was so flush with money. I was like, oh, look at all these organizations from, you know, Elite XC and Affliction, different things that, you know, came out of the gate and they paid too big of purses, and it, you know they went under quickly. But UFC is not even close to being in that type of situation now. Yeah, you're right. So, and, and I mean, even Bellator, I didn't realize this till the other day. I guess Bellator, um, they've they've never had a year where they made money, where they made a profit for CBS, and now they're over on Showtime, which I think is the right place for them. The uh, production is, is much better, and it, it looks like they're on their way to making money now. But yeah, I was very surprised to. When I heard that they had never made a uh, profit in a year. Wow. That's insane. They've been around a long time, too. Yeah, 2000, I think 2008, 2009. Somewhere yep. in there, back with the, 
in the days of only tournaments and now they're kind of going back to the the tournaments the grand prix and things a little bit you know who hasn't made a lot of noise lately is one fc no they canceled quite a few cards i think they were i think they were one of the most locked down places i know singapore was because they weren't even having anything in singapore and they ended up I think doing a few uh, events outside of Singapore. Yeah, they were supposed to like be on this big, you know, crusade of doing all these events, and now it's slowed down. It seems like. Well, they went over to TNT too, and then they had like two or three events on TNT, and they're like, "Oh, well, nobody watched it, so I guess we're done there." <laughs> but wow, that that's that's insane, you know. Because they're, you know, they've had a lot of good shows, but I don't know. The UFC, it looks like to me, like they they control everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They got the money. Now they got the power of ESPN. And uh, it's like the promotion. Like I seen the other day, you got, you know, Colby Covington and Jorge Masvidal on the Stephen A. Smith show. And it's like, you couldn't get better promotion. Right? <laughs> Stephen A. Smith. Oh, gosh. Oh, that guy drives me insane. But <laughs> right? I call him there for a while. I, I, excuse the French, but I would call him uh, Dick Punch because of that video. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> I was like, what so are funny. you practicing to hit here? <laughs> I know. Uh, it's so funny. Uh, I don't know if you ever see those videos. Um, uh, they're cartoon videos of UFC on Facebook. Uh, Mohib, I guess that's his name that does them. Have you ever seen those? Oh yeah, that guy's hilarious. Yeah. He's hilarious. He was doing one of Stephen A. Smith doing those punches. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Oh my gosh. Oh, it kind of reminds out. Yeah, of... that guy's talented. <laughs> yeah, he really is. It would be funny if he did a cartoon series. Yeah, yeah. It would, it would kind of be like the newer, modern, more funnier version of Hulk Hogan's rock and wrestling. <laughs> oh, that's a blast USB. from the past. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it just kind of reminds me of that. But, of course, it's, you know, it's a lot more funny. Uh, but, yeah, it kind of just, it gives me, uh, it gives me a reminder of that cartoon. I'm like, man, this dude needs to evolve into a cartoon. It would do really good. Oh, yeah. Put him over there on Showtimes and run, like, little shorts in between fights. <laughs> oh, he he would blow up huge. Oh, More yeah. than he had ever imagined. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, th I think so. So, so what all are you teaching there? Talk about uh, you're teaching kickboxing, boxing, MMA. Yep, MMA, uh, jiu-jitsu, um, and some little little bit of wrestling as well. Um, it's to me, I teach. I like to teach and break everything down. Like we're kind of like how I got to learn somewhat, and just everything that I was able to grasp from my past um, has made me a it's made me a decent coach. Um, I have a lot of different types of training methods. Um, they're not, uh, they're not like everybody else's. I like to, um, I like to push, you know, um, I like to use a lot of like bungee cords, big, thick ones. I like to use, uh, things to make the athlete more explosive. Uh, just, I like, I like doing different things. Um, a lot of people can get bored doing the same thing over and over. <coughs> so I like to have, you know, my training methods change. I don't want anybody to ever get used to me. Sorry, just. It's okay. <clears throat> so keep getting a dry throat you guys. But yeah. no, I think that's, uh, I, I think that's very important. Yeah, is it, like in, you know, in judo and I had boxing for a while and stuff. Yeah, that was always great to be 
stimulated by a lot of different activities and stuff because I think I think things can get stale. A any competitors there? Yeah, I have a few. I'm actually fixing to uh, in a couple of weeks. We're doing a tournament. Uh, it's called uh, American Grappling Federation. We're going to do the nogi portion this time. Uh, then I got one of my girls fighting this summer uh, in Galveston, Texas, on the island. Uh, she's uh, going to have her first Stammy fight, but you know she's been training on and off with me for the last five years. Oh, wow. uh, she's uh, two and zero oh in kickboxing. She's got an expert world championship in uh, jujitsu. Uh, she wrestled for her high school. She's, you know, pretty good. I'll have to share some videos of her with you. Uh, check her out. You know, she's a uh, very heavy handed, but, uh, you know, uh, got another guy that will possibly fight this summer. He actually used to scout Kyler Murray uh be his uh spy in football ah. <laughs> he's fast uh because kyler's very fast yeah so yeah. Uh, well uh i don't know you know fighters take time to develop especially yeah. nowadays yeah. uh you don't want to just throw anybody in there to fight because you know um people are more wise at these days than they were back then you know more well-rounded yeah you gotta yeah. You know, make sure you got them ready to go. Uh, so this summer we'll be fighting. I look forward to it. It, it kind of, uh, it brings, uh, it breathes air into my life. I love what, I love fight, watching the fight scene and especially more so whenever you're coaching and you're involved. Oh yeah. I, I still look forward to watching fights every, every weekend or every, every opportunity I get. But, uh, yeah um you know it would be so it would be so cool to see you and my buddy todd uh doing a podcast i i could see you two guys working at espn well well thank You're you for the compliment yeah i i can't wait to meet him very knowledgeable oh you're gonna love him i know uh He's a, he's a super cool guy. Like, man, he's a walking encyclopedia for MMA. Like he's been, he's now he's been around the shooto scene a lot. Yeah. He's very, uh, he's got like, he's been around that. And then it's cool though, you know, cause I actually got to go to his house in Oklahoma last year and, um, and got to cook outside for his family. And uh, he was telling me about how he'd been to, you know, different live pride events while in Japan, you know, when he was stationed over there. I'm like, man, I bet that was fun. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, All I'm those sure. People. <laughs> yeah, you know, the I, I would... I think that if you, the difference obviously between going to an event like that or going to a live UFC is the fans are definitely a lot more calm in Japan. A lot more calm, is that what you said? Yes. Oh, not, yeah. I noticed you know, the, the quiet, wild. the respect in the crowd is amazing. <laughs> they wait for a <laughs> technique to happen, then they, they erupt for a minute. You know, it's pretty <laughs> cool. Different. So you're talking about cooking there and you're in texas your barbecue game's got to be strong over there <laughs> um a little bit <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of competition I I, around you <laughs> yeah i i um it's so funny because i probably cook once a week outside i have uh a pretty good size smoker and i have a pretty good size uh barbecue pit slash smoker and then i have another grill so I have a variety to choose from because they're all different yeah. and they're all good yeah. steel. Um, so yeah, from anything from ribeyes, brisket, uh, even your smoked red beans and rice, all kinds of stuff like that. It's just, <laughs> I love cooking. It was so yeah. funny because Todd will see my videos on cooking and stuff and he's like, he put, he put me to cook on his grill in Oklahoma. It was 
it was funny. It was great though, you know. Uh this this sport in the overall you know scene of things of it uh looking looking back has uh brought me some really good friends yeah uh you know um it's just too bad you can't you know in the end of things you can't be everywhere at once i've made you know good friends like ian in canada i got uh one of my one of my close friends out in uh out by uh in wilsonville by portland uh charles grijalva he has uh business fight year yeah. Yeah. He, he sponsors a lot of guys in the northwest um guys in mexico mma uh of course canada you know met people in japan it, you know you meet you meet all kinds of good people <clears throat> at just leave a lasting impression on you and hopefully when this calms down we'll we'll cross paths again yeah th there's a lot of people i'm looking forward to seeing again soon and that that wrestler the wrestlers and the mixed martial arts scene i i feel like they've they've been humbled to a point where you don't you don't get the fakeness from people you get the the real people and everybody i've talked to some people you know, I've been a little intimidated, honestly, to talk to. Like when, you know, I had Randy Couture on the show and I was talking to him before and he's like, relax. He's like, I'm just a person. He's like, re re relax. <laughs> and he's calming me down. <laughs> it's like... That's funny. Yeah, that's good. You know, I mean, same thing like, uh, you know, one of my good friends out in Boston, he he refs a lot of Bellator events, UFC events. Kevin McDonald. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. we when I say we grew up together, we grew up on the fight scene together. Wow. You know, back when it was no gloves, uh, gloves, and um, you know, been on many shows and whatnot you know back in the day and last year when i went to go visit one of my other friends good friends john inglis he who's a ref for bellator he's on kevin's uh he grew up through kevin's uh roughing school it's funny because i remember man i want to say about uh, 15 16 years ago i went to uh ludlow mass uh, did a clinic out there. Frank Samrock was a part of the crew doing a clinic, and uh, there was a few other guys. And I remember Kevin tells me, "Hey, uh, come up to Revere Mass. Uh, I'm going to be refing a show. This is before he got really big, and he was refing." I'm like, "All right." So my buddy John, I'm like, "Hey, John." Let's go to Revere Mass. He's like, oh, man, it's about two hours away from here. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't go. I'm like, okay, because I wanted to introduce him to my friend Kevin. <laughs> well, years later now, John winds up meeting Kevin, and he's now in, you know, he went through Kevin's referee clinics and works with him directly. It's like, man, what a small world. I'm like, dude, you could have avoided all this and just <laughs> <laughs> way back then. And uh, it's funny because uh, when I went there last uh, last year to hang out, we went to the mountains. And then I went back into Boston and met up with Kevin. You know, it was so cool because, you know, I hadn't seen him in a long time. But, you know you develop these friendships with people that are real and you know it's like you pick up right back where you left off that's the beauty of this you know like if i see ian again i will see him again it's gonna be like right where we left off you know like that's the beauty of this sport i'm i'm so thankful that i've met lots of cool people lots <clears throat> Yeah, it, it, it's definitely like, a, you know, nothing else I've ever been involved in. That's that's for sure. Being around this community, that's why I just, you know, can't get enough of hanging around fighters and people that have fought and, you know, yeah, just talking and being around the community. <clears throat> it's uh, been an incredible part of my life. Kevin was refing 
last week, I think. I don't remember if it was over in Ireland. Was he in Ireland for for Bellator? I'm pretty sure he yeah. was. <laughs> okay, yeah. I was like, I knew I seen him this last week, and I was trying to think if it was in Bellator or UFC or uh, or bare knuckle. But uh... I told Kevin, I'm like, man, I'm a, I'm just or no, I'm just like you know one of these. One of these fighters is going to get rude and probably try to swing on Kevin, not knowing that Kevin knows how to fight. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin was tough. You know, back in the day, I'm, man, you know, we fought on a card to get a couple cards together, and Kevin is tough. And I tell you what, though, he's he's as cool as can be. Have you ever met Kevin? No, I haven't. I didn't realize that he fought either. Oh, yes. He was a tough guy. I think he spent some time at Matt Hume's gym also. Okay. Yeah, Kevin Kevin's the real deal as a ref. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 he's definitely in charge in there. <laughs> yeah, he's uh he's come a long way, you know, with his uh he's got a ref school and I'm proud of him. You know, he's he's doing really well for himself. He's been at this for a long time. What where is he uh, doing his refing school out of? I I think he does clinics in different parts. They okay. bring him in. Uh, that's the last I knew. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the refs that are in the Northeast, they pretty much go through Kevin. I think John McCarthy does something too with refs, if I'm correct. I think he, I, I know at least he, I know he definitely used to. I'm, I'm not sure about it now. I know Herb Dean's got his camp because. I actually talked to uh, Herb and his wife, Victoria. I was going to be down there in like a week. He's running March 9th, 10th, and 11th. Um, I, I was wanting to get my, my judging and refing license, but uh, unfortunately I've been in a very long uh, business deal. Well, I've been trying to sell my business, and it's just everything everything moves so slowly now, you know, since COVID, and everything's still not back to 100% here, but... Yeah. It'll get there, and I'll get my. I want to get my ref and my judging license, but yeah, Herb was telling me he's like, yeah, you need to. Uh, he's like, you need to brush up on your jujitsu if you haven't been in there for a while. He's like, because you got to show me all these moves. You better be able to do them if you're going to be judging fighters doing them. I was like, that's great. <laughs> that's great that you know that nice. they're that they're that uh, that detailed because man, I can't stand it. When a when a judge makes a call, when it's like everybody in the room's just like, "What were you thinking?" <laughs> That's true. That's very true. And, and I know Herb, you know, is mostly known for a referee, but I mean, all those guys, Kevin, I'm sure, you know, can can judge a fight with anybody. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, those are honestly, I think that those are two of there's a handful of roughs, you know, that are really, really good. And I, I really, I think those two will fit on a hand. They're very, very good referees. They've prepped a lot of matches. Oh, yeah. Jason Herzog's another one. He's really good. I yeah. mean, they got so yeah. much experience. Yeah, Jason Herzog uh, and, and Mike Beltran. I think those are the Mike Beltran best too, guys yes, out there. It's not, I tell you what, I don't envy their job. <laughs> no, and that's, uh, I, I was talking to my wife about that, you know, and everything has happened so fast as, as a referee, and this is my what I might actually end up doing. I was like, I honestly don't know if I am feel, com feel comfortable refereeing and having that much responsibility on me. I'm like, I would love to judge, and I, I judge fights every week, so like on my fight companion. You know, I've watched thousands of fights. I, I feel pretty comfortable judging. Refereeing, mm -hmm. that's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> you know what's worse, too, is when you're in a smaller cage. Oh, yeah, like, I, I can imagine. Uh, I don't, like I said, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough job. But you know what? Those guys have so much experience, and they stand by their calls. You know, I mean, nobody's perfect. Yeah. But, man, I tell you what, those guys that, that were named are – are some people that I, I got a ton of respect for, you know I mean? They're definitely about the fighter's safety, even when the fighter doesn't think so. Um, they're good. They're great at what they do. 
Oh yeah, and that, and that's what Herb talked to to me about, you know. And I, I talked to him, and he's like, you know, the most important thing is fighter safety. He's like, if if he's like, if the fighters, you know, he's like, if I feel like you're not protecting the fighters, the number one important thing, he's like, you're not gonna get a certificate from me. I don't care if you paid me. He's like, I'll give you my money, your money back, or I won't. But you're not getting a certificate <laughs> from me if uh, right. you know if you're not gonna protect our fighters. And, yeah, I respect that a lot. That's good. You know, I mean, at least these fighters know that they, they got some sort of protection if they are not able to protect themselves in certain situations. You know, I mean, you need, you know, you need, a, you need it to run smoothly in there because, man, it can get ugly real quick. There's been people that have died in our, our sport, and the less deaths, the better, you know, because they happen in boxing every year. Oh man, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it, it's really sad in boxing, and I don't I don't know what you do differently there. For a while, I was like, okay, you know, maybe, I was like, maybe uh, you know, bare knuckles safer. I don't know. Well, they had a death in their first year, so back at I can't remember the name of the fighter now, but uh, it, you know, BKFC twenty guy fell and hit his head and bounced off and broke his neck and went in, you know, was unconscious. I think he was in the hospital for like 30 days or something and then finally passed. And that's all. Sorry, what was yeah, that? That's not awful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine well, dealing with something like that. Remember, there was that Canadian guy, Tim Haig. He passed away in a boxing match too, huh? I didn't hear about that. I remember Tim Haig. Yeah, he passed away. I mean, that was just insane what happened to him. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's, he took too many shots to the head, too. It's this poor guy. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that he had passed. I I that com I completely missed that. Wow. Yeah, I think he was from Canada originally, right? Yeah, Somewhere yeah I'm, by, I'm sure uh, he was a Canadian guy, yeah. Yeah. Big, tough guy, but, man, he can only take so much. Yeah, yeah, that's why I like to, you know, I like to see these guys looking to transition into the next thing, and it's like I've I, I've talked to guys, you know, and I'll, I'll be honest with them, even if I hurt their feelings, like, and I'm not going to say their name, I don't want to embarrass them, but, you know, somebody who's fought in the UFC not too far away, I was like, hey, man, it's like, as your friend, I just really don't think you should fight anymore. Like, I really don't think so. And he, you know, he didn't want to hear that. But, you know, and I, I'll, I'll mention his name to you if you want off off uh, record. But, uh, yeah, it just happens sometimes. It's, it's hard to see guys. And I could see, I mean, I love competing. I love doing anything physical. And it's like, you know, you don't think that you're done or you don't want to be done. I guess maybe when you are, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know that that's the thing. You know, as as the individual that's coming to that crossroads, you know, not everybody makes the wisest choice. You know, and they think that whenever somebody's telling them, "Hey, it, you may want to hang it up," they they think they're probably being looked down upon you know talk down upon and it's not even that you know sometimes you know uh, people i don't think that they really think clearly like i said you know when i suffered those two knockouts like that like uh i'm the type of person i was like you know what i'm not gonna let my uh I'm not going to, back then I was like, I'm not going to let nobody, you know, call me, you know, a crappy fighter. Da, 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 da. Now I look back on it and I'm like, I can't believe, I, I was actually telling, I've never come out open to the, like on a podcast or anything talking about that, but it's so funny because the other day when I was in the gym in class, you know, I was telling my kids, I'm like, don't ever do something like this. Yeah. Yeah, if something like that's ever wrong, you better say something because, you know, that could hurt you in the long run. You know? Uh, oh, I mean, yeah, look, I agree. I mean, you know, a lot of these guys have big, big weight cuts on top of it. And I think that, I think that contributes to, 
you know, some knockouts and different things too. Yeah, Tim Haig, I couldn't believe though. Like, man, just you see a big, strong guy like that, and then you see him where he's helpless in the boxing ring. It's like, gosh, you know, I mean, look, even when Jake Paul hit Tyron Woodley, I mean, good gosh, that could have killed him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that man, that was that was that was a hard shot and like I said, not a not a guy you expect it from. It's like when I see him do that, it's like, okay, yeah, we know you, you can fight now. You might not ever be a world champion, but I'm not ever gonna say you can't fight. But yeah, luckily Woodley recovered from it and And he wants to keep fighting. What. So He need, he needs to stop after that one. your life if you're a father if you're you know you got children you gotta you gotta make wise choices you know well especially a a guy that's you know so diversified he'd already diversified himself outside of the cage you have the the tmz thing uh he does great commentary he's got he's in the music world he's already diversified himself past fighting that's funny. That Mojahid guy makes a cartoon of Woodley singing, <laughs> falling in and out of love with you. <laughs> Racist. Oh, yeah, I see that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then he's got it where all these guys, like, uh, and not making fun of these guys because it's happened to me too. Why, not once, but twice. But these guys that get knocked out, they join Ben Askren up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's just so crazy yeah I, I love the ghosts that he has where they float up and all the other ghosts yeah. are waiting up there for him you know I, I uh I, I when I see somebody get knocked out my first reaction is like oh no like I know what they feel like people can stay all day long oh you don't feel anything that is not true yeah I don't yeah not true i mean you feel weird that's what you feel i mean look chuck liddell's another had too many fights oh yeah yeah and it's like it's hard to tell somebody like that and i know chuck and i I know other fighters have said similar things but when he was fighting tito the third time it's like man why are you doing this and somebody's asked me he said one of the biggest reasons that you know the things that he missed the most about fighting he said was walking down to the cage and hearing his name and hearing the crowd and hearing the fans and um you know you know that is so i can identify with that right like when i had my 40th birthday it was a surprise party and i walked into this restaurant and the DJ starts playing like a mix of a series of songs that I walked out to. Oh, that's awesome. And I just, you know what? I broke down crying. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I, you know, it's, it's crazy that Chuck says that cause granted I never did anything as big as him, but you know, I, I identify with it, man. It's uh, it's something you miss, you know, hearing people screaming, even if it's an obscenity. It's just, <laughs> you know, you got your music playing, you're in a zone, and you're ready to bite down on your mouthpiece and go to war. And, you know, uh, but you know what, though? I would never do it again. <laughs> I don't care what kind of shape I'm in. Like, yeah. you know, it, it goes back to that logic of thinking, I don't want to take years away from my life. Yeah. Uh, I need to be here for a bunch of people. But yeah, I can identify with what he's saying. It's it's something you'll miss. Have you ever fought? Um, yeah, I have some. I mean, I did quite a bit of judo, but I also did some amateur boxing. And the coolest thing that I did, you know, that I got to do is you remember the tough man competition oh, back yeah. in the day? Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't a lot of times it wasn't the, you know, the greatest boxers. What you do learn, because I was around schools at the time, is that a lot of those guys have 
10 times the experience that they let you know on television <laughs> because some of those guys were really good. And, yeah. uh, you know, like I fought like a couple guys, you know, I won my first couple fights and I was like, oh yeah, these guys really don't know what they're doing. And then, uh, you know, a guy that was running my corner before and he's like, this guy hits really hard. He's like, if he hits you, he's like, it's, it's not going to be like anybody else hitting you. And he knew who this guy was. And this is, I fought at 175 at the time. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I've been hit before. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i sure you've experienced this or felt, you know, when a guy hits you and you're like, oh, yeah, I know what a hit is. And it's like, this guy hit me. It's like, that's a fist. Oh, my God, that's a fist I got hit by. I felt like I got hit by a sledgehammer. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's some guys that hit extremely hard. And it's pretty crazy, you know. But, yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to underestimate anybody. And then those tough mans, you know, they, you never knew who you were going to draw. You know, you got a guy that may not be so good. And then, then you got that guy that hits like a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah. 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 You got to be careful with those, you know? Well, speak, I don't think they're around anymore. I don't know if it's the same company that does tough enough now. Maybe they just moved along, but. Unfortunately, like we were talking about deaths, they had a lot of them. They were not the greatest organization for a while. Yeah, you're right. You know, it's uh, I don't, I don't think that that tough. I don't think it's legal anymore. Yeah, I don't see how they could, how it could have been in the way that they used to do it. Because, you know, after I did it, I did it two different years, and I, I watched like a kind of documentary thing on it. And a lot of times they didn't even have doctors there. They had one where the only guy there was a veterinarian. It was, it was wild. Uh, so I was lucky where I was at. I did it, the one in the tri cities in the Coliseum. There was doctors there. There was a lot of coaches. There was, cause I'd been a little around the boxing scene. Luckily there was a lot of people that I'd recognized, but I guess a lot of smaller towns, it wasn't that way. Yeah, um, well, then you can definitely identify, too, though, with making your way into that ring. It's a it's a feeling that, I don't know, I guess kind of like a football player can identify with it or a basketball player because when they go down their tunnel to go play their sport. <laughs> I remember when I fought in Japan, you know, and it I guess it was my turn to fight him. I had already warmed up. I'm sitting down on a chair and my cornerman, Shannon Ritz is like, Hey, they're, let's go. They're calling you. I'm like, I'm sitting there. My life is flashing before my <laughs> eyes. I'm having memories of, uh, me being on a skateboard <clears throat> going to, going to visit a, <clears throat> back at the time uh an ex-girlfriend or i'm sitting in a class at school getting in trouble <laughs> or you know <laughs> we're talking too much or uh just doing silly things you know uh, or my dad you know uh telling me to behave and next thing you know he's like hey it's like oh wh what am i doing here <laughs> <laughs> And then it's time to go, you know, like, uh, I was very, uh, I was like, wow, okay, it's time to put on, let's go. But, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I can't wait till one of these kids from in here gets their opportunity to do it, you know, so they know how it feels that their hard work will pay off, you know, um, I don't want them to think, oh, you're just in here to train hard and that's it. It's a dead end there. No, there's more to this if you want to explore it. A lot more. <laughs> there's yeah. a whole world yeah. out there. I, I can't even uh, imagine the feeling of like the crowds in Japan and everything. Because I, I was just telling Ian, he's been training with some uh, high level judo guys, which I, I mean, I've been in love with judo since I, I was 16 years old. And uh, I was telling him, like, I miss just walking out onto the mat in a judo match. And there might only be 100 people there if there was that. And I told him, I'm like, I'm getting back into that just just to compete. 
Yeah, That's so at cool. that level, I imagine it can become addictive, probably. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yes. That's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, some of these, <clears throat> I don't know, some, it, it's funny because the little town I live in is known for uh, being the hometown of Nolan Ryan. Okay. Yeah. And it's funny because there's a few other schools here, but, you know, they don't bring the same history to a gym I do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've been around a lot uh, all over, um, you know, got to fight a lot of different places. Uh, just, just the world of experience. I've been open 17 years now. Wow. Um, I'm 48. I started my training when I was four. So it's been a part of my life for October will be 45 years. You, know, you don't remember anything. Else. You, you don't ever remember oh. having a life without fighting then. Yep. It's been a way of life for me. You know, and just, just to see the way that it affects some of the people that have stuck around with me for a good amount of time. Um, it's worth it. Yeah. I, I can't imagine anything being more rewarding. And I'm, I'm sure the business part of it took a while to, to get down. <laughs> yeah, it did. I, I, I've heard from some people that were fighters and some guys that are pretty top notch that it's not, not always the easiest way to make a living. <laughs> no, I've had John Peretti in my gym before. Really? Okay. Remember him? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember him. Remember the, the ex Extreme Battlecade? Yeah. Yeah, where, yeah, where yeah I remember. I actually think I have Smith. that DVD set. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had him in here before. I've had Pele in here before. Makako visiting me. Uh, I've had a lot of different people walk through here. <laughs> and it's so funny because when I first opened up, uh, it just, you know, it was a small little gym, but I, I put in here and put a lot of time effort and it's been rewarding. The good Lord's been good to me. Um, I wouldn't have anything in here if it wasn't for him, you know? So I'm putting good people in front of me, uh, parents that trust their kids with me, you know, uh, it takes a whole team effort, so I'm fortunate, and I feel like if, uh, you know, I can keep going a lot longer if I need to. Yeah, well, I mean, that's awesome to have such a, re a rewarding career like that and be able to scratch that itch, I'm sure, after, you know, not going in there and having to get punched in the face. <laughs> Probably don't miss that part. Right. No, I don't. No more. <laughs> so do, do you watch fighting now, like a, on a pretty regular basis, like UFC? and I do. Um, I watch. Uh, I do watch some fights. Some fights intrigue me. And then again, every once in a while, uh, I'll be like, who is this? And kind of like... Uh, one of the guys I really like is that guy who's got a, like a man bun, uh, Yuri. Yuri Prochaska. Wow, that guy is incredible, isn't he? Yeah, I remember I was watching him over in Ryzen and some of the, you know, the ones that play till like six in the morning in, in, U, in USA. And then when they announced him coming to the UFC, I'm like, that guy's going to be good. <laughs> Yeah. I think he's, you know, I was so happy when Glover Teixeira beat uh, Jan Blachowicz. Um, I actually was telling, you know, I was with Todd Atkins. We were on his podcast, and I told him, I was like, Todd, that would be so cool if uh, Glover can uh, pull this off for the old school. Yeah. You know, yeah. and he did it. I was so happy for Glover, but, oh, man. 
this fight he's got with this cat is oh this is a monster monster. yeah yeah Yeah, i'm I'm, uh, and i like i i like glover to share a lot you know but oof if glover was about 10 years younger man he was like a he was like a grizzly bear he oh, was man, falling he was, everywhere. I want to say he was like 20 and 0 with like 20 knockouts or something when he came to the UFC. Yeah, well, I remember he was with uh, Chuck Liddell and them, but he had a visa issue, I think it was. And so a lot of his career got spent down there. He said, oh, that's too bad. Like he should have been in the UFC a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. he, he was very polished. Uh, when he got there, he was a, yeah, he was a scary guy. He is a scary guy, but he was back, you know, when he was younger, you know, your reflexes are faster. That's anybody. And man, he would, he was, he would have been a nightmare for anybody back then. But it's just too bad that at this stage, they want him to fight this young lion. Who's just, uh, <laughs> he's an animal in his own right. Like, oh yeah. Man, yeah. I, yeah. Oh. You're, you're, he's a beast. He's uh, it just keeps getting better every fight. Yeah, I, yeah. He's he, I, I think that guy is gonna rule that division for a while. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I think you might be right. Um, there's a couple there's a couple dark horses there. Um, you know, Dominic Reyes gave him a good fight. Um, uh, I don't know if Dominic's gonna mentally get back to where he was because that was such a tough loss. Oh my gosh, he got cracked. But uh, I and, felt so bad for him. Oh yeah, uh, especially everything that's happened to him since you know he he beat John Jones. That's a fight that I will call. I don't care who was champion. He beat John Jones. He won rounds three, four, and five, in my opinion. He did. Yeah. To me, I think John Jones was. Uh, he wasn't there mentally. No, I, I think he needs challenges, and we'll see what he does at heavyweight now. This is, I guess it could go two different directions, but yeah, he mega talented dude for sure. I don't see, I don't see uh, Cyril Gunn or Francis out wrestling him. No, no, and I mean I know yeah, Francis's wrestling's obviously gotten a lot better, training with Usman, but John Jones is another level. That's, yeah. a, that's something incredible. Well, I don't want to take up your whole day. Thank you for such a long interview. Uh, a good interview. Learned yeah. a lot and uh, kind of felt like talking hey. with an old friend. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's what I feel like. I I, I feel the same way. And uh, thank you so much for having me on and also Ian for introducing us. I, I feel very, uh, very honored. Yeah, thank you. Real, real quick, you got a prediction for this weekend. Jorge Masvidal and Colby Covington. Who do I want to win? <laughs> Who's going to win? Uh, I think uh, Colby's volume is going to be too much. He's going to drag that fight into the later rounds. Uh, I see Colby winning. Uh, but if it ends quickly... You know who's going to end that one quickly if it yeah, does. Yeah, that, that, that's where my gut is, is that Colby, you know, he'll either, the, like you said, the quantity or the wrestling, he'll just wrestle him. And if I'm Jorge Masvidal, and I'm sure he's already got this in his head, it's like you got to get so far into Colby's head and get, if you can if you can get him to trade with him, I think that's his chance. It's like challenge that machismo. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that, you're right. You're, I, I, I agree with you 100% on that. But is Colby going to fall for that trap? Probably not. I wouldn't mind seeing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, just the thing with that is, you know, he's already had his jaw broke by Usman. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And he's been and, fighting forever. <laughs> yep. That's going to be in the back of his mind. Do I want to risk my jaw getting broke again? Yeah. Your jaw's never going to recover from that. Yeah. And then he had a, and then he just came out of a war with Usman again. Yeah. So, I don't know. 
this is it's going to be an interesting fight. The fans are going to win for sure. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good fight. A lot of people are counting Masvidal out. I definitely don't call it Masvidal out. I think people underestimate his footwork. His footwork is just, uh, I mean, yeah. I always knew it was good. And then when he fought Nate Diaz, I was like, oh, wait. These guys are not even close as far as this part of their game. No. It looked like uh, like he was on an ice skating rink versus a guy who's on a regular floor. Like, he was, he moved so quickly. Yeah. I hate yeah. saying it, but Nate looked like Bambi on ice. Oh, yeah. And I, I got a lot of respect for Nate. But, I mean, deep down inside, uh, I would not doubt that Nate was not real upset with that referee for stopping that fight. I agree with you. I mean, Nate's a Nate's a great fighter, but I mean, man, like, like you're saying, Usman's footwork is very good. You know, Usman's got. Fa I'm sorry, not Usman. Uh, Masvidal. He's got fast hands too. His hands are yeah. very fast. They're lethal. But look at what Usman did too. So he's coming off a knockout loss too. So <sighs> this is going to be an interesting fight. Who do you got? Uh, kind of the same way. I, I think Colby's probably going to grind out, you know, a unanimous decision, win four or five. But I, I, I just, I hope Masvidal can draw him into a war and, uh, you know, make it an interesting fight. But, yeah, if I got a bet on it, I would have to take Colby as well. Okay. Oh. I think so. <laughs> That's the safe bet. Yeah. All um, right. Well, hey, thank you very much, Adam. I uh, really appreciate this, and thank you again to Ian. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I I really really appreciate it, Mike. Uh, that's uh, your show is great, top notch, and for anybody that's listening to it, Mike's had a lot of great people on his show, and he's very knowledgeable. Now I got to get you and Mr. Todd Atkins together. That's going to be one of my goals. That's going to be awesome. All right. Well, well, hopefully soon. All right, Adam. Okay. You have a blessed day, and maybe one of these days I'll be out in the great Northwest, and we'll get to meet up. Hey, that would be awesome. Thanks again. Take yes, care. Sir. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. For myself, Seattle Mike, and Adam Aguera, as always, I love you, I respect you, and I'll see your fine asses next time.